Our program this evening is Camp Galliard, the 15th Engineers, also known as the Pittsburgh Pioneers. The First World War ravaged Europe from July of 1914 until November 1918. During the four years of fighting, 17 million people perished, including 100,000 American troops. And whenever I did the research, I, you know, I, I found that 17 million, but today when I was going over the program again, I thought, I wonder if I made a mistake, because that's an awful lot of people. And I went back and, and checked, and in fact, it was a, I saw in numbers anywhere from 16 to 21 million people died in that war. And that was both fighting uh, soldiers and civilians. But I never realized how devastating that war was. You know, we, I guess we pay attention more to World War II, but World War I was, was uh, a very bad war. So what was this war all about? The countries of Europe had entered into treaties and alliances that I think they never thought they would have to honor. And the whole thing started on June 28, 1914, when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austria-Hungarian Austria throne, was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist. So immediately after the assassination, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. Well, Serbia was aligned with Russia. Austria-Hungary was aligned with Germany. So in response, Germany declared war on Russia. Now France was an ally of Russia, so they entered the war. And then Great Britain, who was an ally of France, came in. Then we had Italy, Greece, and Romania entered on the side of the Allies, while Bulgaria and Turkey sided with the Germans. So you had all these people jumping into this fight and don't really know what the reason was except for the assassination of the Archduke. Finally, on April 2nd, 1917, United States entered the war on the side of France, Britain, and Russia. And you say, well, why did we get involved in that? It was clearly a European uh, fight. How did we get drawn into it? Well, there were three main reasons. The first being the sinking of the Lusitania. And I'm sure you've probably all heard about that. It was a British passenger liner that was sunk by German submarines. And a number, I think over 1,200 people uh, perished in that. Second, Germany declared unrestricted submarine, submarine warfare on all ships in the Atlantic. So that made ships from the United States vulnerable to attack. And third, and what I found most interesting, and I never really heard this before, uh, intelligence sources intercepted the Zimmermann telegraph. Zimmermann was a German diplomat, and he was corresponding with Mexico. And they found out that what he had done was, he was urging Mexico to enter the war on the side of the Germans. And that way they could tie up the United States here in North America. He also promised that after the war, when Germans won the war, that they would give Mexico, Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. And I'd never heard that story. But anyways, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And President Wilson, who vowed to never go to war, finally uh, declared war and off we went. Another sad thing, I guess you could call this a family feud. Because King George of England, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, and Tsar Nicholas of Russia were all cousins. And these leaders, again, cousins, but they were fighting. And all the people that died because of, of this war. In May of 1917, the United States Army ordered Colonel Edgar J J Jadwin to raise a company of Army engineers to go to Europe to build and repair the infrastructure damaged by the fighting. Now, Colonel, Colonel Jadwin graduated from West Point in 1890. He had a degree in engineering. After West Point, he served in the Spanish-American Spanish War under General David Galliard. 
After the war, Jadwin was assigned as chief engineer on a project to improve and enlarge the harbor at Ellis Island. When he finished that project, he joined uh, General Galliard on the Panama Canal project because General Galliard was the chief engineer in, cons in charge of construction of the Panama Canal and Colonel Jadwin was his assistant. After the canal was finished, Colonel Jadwin was assigned to Pittsburgh where he was placed in charge of the locks and dams on the three rivers. And it was while he was serving in Pittsburgh that he was ordered to raise this company of engineers. He set up a recruiting office in the Farmers Bank building in downtown Pittsburgh. And while recruiting was underway, he had to scout out a location for a training camp. Well, I don't know how he ended up out here, but he chose the farm of Jacob Pyle, which was located on the hilltop above Oakmont. The Army paid Mr. Pyle $300 for the use of his 30-acre farm. And Colonel Jadwin recruited heavily from the engineering students at Carnegie Tech and the University of Pittsburgh. So he had a strong pool to pull, to pull from, and so that's where he recruited a lot of his, his engineers. Colonel Jadwin named the camp Camp D.D. Galliard in honor of his friend, General David DeBose Galliard, the chief engineer on the Panama Canal. So that's how the camp got its name. The new recruits were ordered to report to the Halton Station in Oakmont on the morning of May 23rd. The new troops were marched up Halton Road to the Pyle Farm where they established the camp. The first order of business was to install a water line from the Oakmont Water Authority tank which is located up on 909 and I think you can still see that on the right hand side just before you get the Longwood. Well they ran a water line from there 4,000 feet down the hill to the camp and that supplied fresh water for the soldiers. Within less than a week the camp was fully operational. And this is a picture that was in the Pittsburgh Press and you can see Pittsburgh Pioneers open camp at Halton. The top picture are the men, they said they marched but they don't look like they're marching there. <laughs> they're, they're carrying their luggage up Halton Road. Uh, the next picture they're starting to put up their tents and then there's a picture of the camp and then the bottom picture is um, a truck delivering supplies to the camp. And then uh, that's one of the commanders, that's not Jadwin, but one of the commanders in charge of getting things set up. The camp included four mess tents, a hospital, a post office, a barber shop, tailor shop, and two hospitality tents, one provided by the Knights of Columbus and the other by the YMCA. Telephone booths were installed at the YMCA tent. And this is an overview of the camp as it looked in 1917. On May 26th, uniforms and guns arrived at the camp and the men received their first round of vaccinations. And again, this is a picture that was in the uh, Pittsburgh Press and that's the men receiving their guns. By May 28th, there were 1,300 troops at Camp Galliard. Training duties included marches along Halton Road out to North Bessemer and back. And Professor Roberts, Robertson, a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, arrived at the camp to teach the troops the basics of the French language. And at that point, they realized where they were going to be deployed. And out in Plum Borough, they have uh, some oral histories. And one of the ladies they interviewed, uh, when she was young, she was at Davidson School in North Bessemer. And she talked about, she remembered the troops marching out there from the training camp in East Oakmont and turn around and march back to the camp. Although they were training for war, life at Camp Galliard was quite relaxed. The soldiers probably weren't aware what they would face when they arrived in Europe. Any soldier that lived near the camp was allowed to go home on the weekends. Family members were encouraged to visit the camp and people from Oakmont came out and visited with gifts for the troops. There was a man in Oakmont who had a dump truck and he would run a shuttle service between Camp Galliard and downtown Oakmont. He would charge them a nickel apiece and pile them in the back of the truck and, and bring them into Oakmont. Entertainment included concerts by the Oakmont Chamber of Commerce Band, the Verona Oddfellows Band, and the Pittsburgh Mail Chorus. And again, this is one of the streets in the camp here. You can see the tents on both sides of the, of the walkway there. 
On June 22nd, two suspicious, two suspicious men were discovered lurking near the Bessemer High Level Bridge near the camp. Uh, they were captured and they were found out to be German nationals. They were taken up to the New Kensington Jail where they were placed in custody until officials from the Army came and took them away. And they never said what happened to them. Uh, they didn't know whether they were possibly looking to sabotage the bridge because that was a main supply line into the steel mills of Pittsburgh or whether they were just spying on the soldiers at Camp Galliard. Tragedy struck the camp on the evening of June 28th. The men were competing in a track and field competition when a violent thunderstorm approached from the west. Heavy rain, wind, hail, and lightning pounded the camp. The winds were so strong that they blew away all the tents. The men had nowhere to take cover because the tents were blown away. Lightning was flashing, thunder. There were a few soldiers who took cover in the phone booths at the YMCA tent. However, a bolt of lightning came down and struck the phone booth. John Marshall of Aspinwall, one of the privates, was killed and four others were injured by the lightning strike. However, in just two days, the camp was completely rebuilt. By July 1st, the troops were preparing to break camp. The Pittsburgh chapter of the Red Cross sent bandages and medical supplies out to the camp. The battalion traveled to Pittsburgh on July 4th to march in the Independence Day Parade. The following day, on the 5th, the veterans of the Spanish-American War, along with dignitaries from Allegheny County and the city of Pittsburgh, arrived at Camp Galliard to bid the troops farewell. And again, this is another picture from the Pittsburgh Press, and that's the 15th marching in downtown Pittsburgh in the Independence Day Parade. At midnight on July 6th, residents who lived near the camp were awakened by large bonfires as the troops were ordered to burn the camp and march at daybreak.